Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth annual David Saunders Lecture, held in honor of our founding director, David Saunders, who um, started the school more than 20 years ago and led it for, for quite a few years. Um, so, and David retired five years ago, um, and in honor of his retirement, we instituted this lecture series. But any cursory observation of David's professional and uh, life and life as a, as a roving ambassador and public health advocate will tell you that he's far from retired, actually. Quite the opposite. He's here with us um, almost constantly, um, which we're very pleased about. So I'd like to welcome all our winter school participants who've joined us, the People's Health University participants who are also here this week, and everybody else who's come. So we've got some of the senior officials from the Department of Health um, and from the City of Cape Town. We've got colleagues from other departments, um, colleagues from neighboring universities, welcome everybody. I'm Helen Schneider, I'm the director of the school at, currently, and I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, and our guest speaker tonight is Professor Sundara Raman, who's come all the way from Mumbai to talk to us and, and honor us. Um, and before I introduce him, however, um, I'd like to ask our uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Innovation to welcome you on behalf of the University. So over to you, Prof. Franz von der Poel. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you very much for the introduction. Helen. It's indeed, indeed a great honor for me to welcome you all here this evening, but especially Professor Sunda as our guest speaker for the annual uh, David Sanders Lecture. Before we start, I think for the, most of you probably aware of who Professor Sanders is and what he has done, but since it's the annual lecture in honor of him, I think I just want to say a few words um, in addition to what Helen already said that he established the, the School for Public Health and he headed it until 2009. He has a lot of experience and has worked extensively in the region and globally. He was also a health clerk visiting scholar at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 2005 and also honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine from 2005 to 2007. He's a visiting professor in Berlin, as well as at the Center for International Health at the University of Bergen in Norway, where he still continues to collaborate. He's been appointed as honorary professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at UCT in July 2013, and also professor in the School of Medicine in the F Faculty of Health Sciences at Flinders University in South Australia. In 2012, he was awarded an honorary doctorate by UCT. In 2013, he was a recipient of the International Academic Partnership Merit Award from Eduardo Mondlana University in Mozambique. And in 2014, he received the Public Health Innovation and Lifetime Achievement Award from the Public Health Association of South Africa. So we're really honored at the University of the Western Cape Prof to still have you as an emeritus professor here that you still collaborate with us and really look forward to this fourth annual uh, David Sanders lecture and also the fifth one next year. And like Alan has said, you're not near retirement as one can see here. <laughs> Briefly about the school um, which was uh, established in 1993 um, under Professor Sanders and the purpose specifically to strengthen education and research in public health and primary health care and to build capacity for health systems and health services, not only in South Africa, but also in the region and the continent. 
Since the inception, the School of Public Health has established itself as a significant and pioneering initiative in public health with national, continental and international profile, standing and influence. Some of the main achievements include the establishment of a multi-level postgraduate program in public health, including the master's program, culminating into doctors and postdoctoral education, continuing education opportunities for health and welfare through the annual summer and winter school, similarly like the winter school which is currently running here, teaching manuals and material which are being provided and distributed widely, designated as a World Health Organization Collaborating Center in Research and Training of Human Resources and Health Development. In 2012, the, under the DST NRF, the National Initiative or the National Agency for High Level Human Capital Development, a first Saatchi chair was awarded to the School for Public Health. And last year, a second chair, national chair, was awarded, which Professor Alan Schneider will start to occupy from the 1st of July. Big funds has been raised over the years, and the center is really regarded as internationally a leading entity in postgraduate education and research. This is in line with the overall orientation of the school and also with the vision and the ambition of the university to become a research intensive university, but focusing specifically on the importance of health in addressing the global sustainable development goals and making a contribution on the African continent. Uh, if Helen introduces Professor Sunda for short, Sunda in terms of short, uh, of surname for short, not introducing you short, um, <laughs> you will realize that um, we could hardly think of someone more appropriate, more fitting, and more experienced than Professor Sunda to present this annual lecture. Welcome to UWC. Thank you very much to you all. I look forward to being with you the whole evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Professor Nicole. Professor Sundar Raman, or Sunda, as he's known to friends and colleagues, is most well known to many of us as the architect of the Metanin program, a very large and very successful community health worker program in Chhattisgarh State in India, established in the early 2000s under an institution called the Chhattisgarh State Health Resource Centre, which um, I suspect we'll hear more about this evening. From 2009, uh, Sunda went on to establish the National Rural Health Mission under the National Health Resource Centre in Delhi, seeking to take to scale the innovations of Chhattisgarh across India and establishing the ASHA Community Health Worker Programme that is now very widely known and recognized in internationally and involving close to a million workers. Um, the Rural Health Mission then developed an urban counterpart and became the National Health Mission. The National Health Mission is probably the largest primary healthcare strengthening initiative across the globe of, in recent times. And Prof. Sundara Raman is thus very aptly qualified to talk to us on the topic of this evening's lecture. In 2014, Sunda handed over the reins of, of the NHRC, the National Health Resource Centre in India, to new leadership and is now the Dean of the School of Health System Studies at the highly regarded Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. He's a leading authority on the Indian health system, has been involved in a multitude of commissions and policy processes in India and in the Asian region, and any dis definitive statements or publications on the Indian health system generally have Sunda as, as, a, as an author. Um, Sunda was not, however, always involved in public health, and in fact, for the first 20 odd years of his working life, he, he led a very different life as, as a clinician. He was a physician and professor of internal medicine um, at the Jawaharlal Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education Research in Pondicherry, South India, one of the prestigious medical institutions in India, where, amongst other things, 
He studied the clinical effects of, of scorpion and snake bites, indicating possibly a side interest in things that creep and crawl. Um, so while working as a physician, he did, however, engage extensively in civil society mobilizations and, and activism, um, and, and has been for many years a leading member of, of the People's Health Movement that has been extremely active in, in India over many years, but is a global movement um, across continents. This is where he and David's paths have mostly intersected. Um, and they've been close associates for, for many, many years, sharing a similar outlook on life, addressing similar themes in their work, Sundas the David Saunders of, of India. Um, both of them playing pivotal roles as advocates in these fields, inspiring and mentoring others, and actually with, I think, quite similar leadership styles, um, combining um, st very strong principle with, with charisma and, and sharp intellect. Um, and through this association, we've had the good fortune at the school of, of having a number of people from People's Health Movement in India participate in our programs at the, at the School of Public Health. Um, one of these is Sulakshana Nandi, who's currently enrolled in our PhD program. And um, this is what she said of David and Sunda. Basically, they're very similar in thought, intensity and of, of work, and ability to just keep at it forever. <laughs> Um, only Sunda is definitely more punctual than David. Um, she didn't say whether Sunda can be as infuriating and drive us as mad as David at times. Um, but this is what Sulakshana also said of Sunda's unique contribution in India. Um, he's always chosen to work with government, implementing these absolutely enormous large-scale government programs while simultaneously being instrumental in building and strengthening civil society and, and rights-based networks. Um, subversion is what he believes in, although she's not sure he wants you to know that. So with that, I'd like now to invite um, Prof. Sundara Raman to address us on the topic of strengthening public health systems, what works, what does not. Over to you, Sundar. Just shout if you can't hear at the back, please. Thank you all for this honor, this warmth with which you have invited me and completely humbled by it and to be called on par with David Sanders, a person whom, one of the few persons, because we are all arrogant in our own ways, <laughs> to whom I would say or said who has been a mentor of mine, I would think is a unique honor indeed and I am really humbled and happy to be here. I must also thank Helen for this most generous introduction about myself. Seldom have I heard myself described in these terms. I think I would really look forward to working with you. I chose this as an opportunity to come here and dedicate this whole presentation to renewing a long and cherished relationship I have. And David to me is three things. He is a close friend a person with which we can have a good argument over a beer <laughs> and enjoy the whole of it afterwards. As few who have been in a long tradition where polemics was the name, I don't think young people will understand polemics as a way of thinking at one point, but as polemics were, we were polemicists and at some point it was never as good as that and as a close friend over all these years on this. It's, I think, about 16 years now that we've been in touch since we first met. And also, as at some point, uh, persons who have shared our passions on community health workers. And we first met 
in a way in which we registered to each other, I think the second meeting, that was in Pune in a workshop where I made my presentation of the Mithanian program. And it's all right now to talk about it, but at that time we were in the pits. It was 2004, there was a scathing evaluation that was not really giving us space. There were donors who were backing out and things looked really bleak. At some point we were trying to make the case and hold on. In two years we turned it around. At some point we, need, we got the funding that we required and it became national policy to support it. It became recognized and one of the things was a certain visibility that David gave to the Mithanin program. We got a commentary written on the program in Lancet which helped that program got be taken up in the National Rural Health Mission as the ASHA program. And certainly the international recognition that it gave a program, Chhattisgarh is really out beyond. It's like maybe the Northwest or something like that in South Africa. I don't know, one of the states which is most out of the mainstream. And therefore, people don't even take seriously what you do there. And at some point to say that we had made an advance there was not. Today, of course, there is much more universal recognition even within India of the Mithanan program. But at a time of great difficulty, that support was to be uh, one of the many turning points that made and we are eternally grateful for that. The other thing that was a deep bond which Helen already referred to was our work together in the People's Health Movement building together a solidarity that was to actually strengthen uh, the movement both in India and here and across the world. I remained, of course, largely confined to India. There's other colleagues of mine who took the international platform. India, I thought, was large enough. And I don't think that I needed any challenge outside and really needed engagement to keep going over there. So I, my presence outside India has been very limited. And largely it's when David calls or something like that. But usually I've had to. But in India, I think I have covered almost every state, most of the day, so many districts and so many meetings. Every time one is always in thing. I go back now, the very next week I'm in another meeting. And therefore India takes up a lot of time. But in people's health movement, we were able to share and grow. And of course, a larger issue of strengthening public health systems. For us, it was not just a matter of community health works. It's also about what can be doing. There are a lot of uh, organizations in the world who are activist and oppositional, but not really engage with what are the alternatives and ways to move things forward. That was something that we shared with David. I think also with the University of Western Cape, this is my third visit here. And I was here at a time when we were still operating out of prefabricated buildings and this building was shown to me as something coming up. Well, I cannot imagine how far you have gone in this. I cherish this association. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for this opportunity on this. I'm going to actually look at this issue and try to make some sense of the whole mass of information that one has over this. We know this about public health systems. They unfortunately underperform. And I put the word unfortunately to express a partisanship in this issue. It's not something that we would want them to perform. We work for them to perform. But at some point they underperform. And we all know that underinvestment is one of the problems. But public health systems are also characterized by a whole host of issues that you are all familiar with. I don't need to stress them again. But the key issue is, when we move forward, how do we put together a framework within which we can explain it and within which we can think of alternatives and ways to strengthen it? Because certainly the ways we strengthen it in India or even within India, one state and the other will differ a lot. But the question is, is there a framework of understanding? Unfortunately, the major framework that we have today is what I characterize here as the neoliberal understanding of public services on the whole. What does it say? It says that it is markets that ensure the efficient distribution of goods and services. That the state is a regressive instrument 
best limited as much as possible. It flows out of something in economics is the general equilibrium theory. And it is competition and choice in this understanding that ensures quality and affordability of all goods and services. So in this understanding, public services are inefficient and of poor quality because it is its nature to be so. It is inherent in the enterprise because market forces are not at work. And wherever market forces are not at work, shit happens, so to speak. <laughs> the power provider as a monopoly, consumers cannot exit. So they have this three thing about exit, voice, and hierarchy. And consumers cannot exit to another provider because there is none or because the alternative is costly. Subsidy to public provider allows him to command the market despite inefficiency. Consumers have no voice, democratic Authority is too distant and you can't vote with your feet and get out of the system. There are no incentives to providers or leadership to improve quality of care or even extent of services. They get the same salary irrespective of whether they work or they don't work. I think at the end of this slide you would be quite convinced of what I am saying on this. But it is very persuasive argument and one has to really see how it flows off. Leaderships align it to corrupt political leaderships because there is no real trigger for leaderships from the ground, not to consumer need. So hierarchy as control is weak. The first round of reforms that was based in this is called structural adjustment reforms, which talked of privatization of public services. But today we are in a second way. We talked of user fees. It talked of a number of measures of making it more corporate-like. But today that's not what it is talked of. Here, in fact, some of these project this as going beyond neoliberal, but in the framework I am using it, I use it as only the next wave of neoliberal intervention, not as something that is, uh, it, which is distancing itself from the neoliberal <coughs> order. Information and asymmetry, it accepts that this is a market failure, though at some point it is cautious about it, but it resolves this problem by saying that institution should act, which will do the purchase on behalf of people because individual consumers can't make the purchase on behalf of themselves. It also further posits that the institution cannot be the state as the Department of Health itself is a provider and that is a conflict of interest and a new institution suitably distanced from the government to remove this conflict has to be created. But by purchasing for public and provide private provider alike, both of whom offer the same services at now equalized price, we can ensure competition and choice because at some point you are contracting this out through a process of competition. And now the provider will have rewards, incentives for good performance and disincentives for poor performance. This is largely also related to public choice theories which have been constructed, we have Deglers North, you have Eleanor Ostrom, in some sense you talk of institutions and how they can mediate this. This in a sense is a comprehensive framework. It tends to explain all that goes wrong and tends to offer solutions. These solutions are in terms of purchasing, contracting, financing. And we need to look at how it plays out and I must say that though the slides will have the abstractions, the examples I will speak out and they are largely from India, though one or two important ones I take from elsewhere to make the case on this. So in neoliberal reforms, one of the most preferred thing is the shift to insurance. But in India, from 2008 to 2014, a number of new insurance schemes called publicly financed health insurance, or in other words, PHFI, publicly financed PFHI, the publicly financed health insurance is lost, were, were launched, the Rashtriya Swasthya Bhima Yojana, that is the National Health Insurance Program, then you have, it's slightly different from what is in Vaisajriya, so the word is similar, then the Arogya Sri, then the Rajiv Gandhi Jeevandai Yojana, and a number number of state and national schemes. But all of them, seven years down the line, a huge number of evaluations show that they have serious problems. For one thing, you have removed price in the, as an issue of consumer choice and you faced with overconsumption. And pr patients and providers consume more services than required because it is prepaid. 
but this maximizes consumption and not solidarity. The original understanding when, in which insurance was born, the Bismarckian concept was based on a certain understanding of solidarity. But here it is actually in this logic looking at if somebody buys a premium, he would like to make sure that it is utilized and converted in. So actually people would try to exhaust their sum assured rather than leave it to as a thing that it is not the sick taking care of the non-poor but everybody trying to get the maximum out of his deal. And that itself, therefore you also find that the care is supply driven and determined. And if you look at what the claims ratio, what the diseases have been paid for and what is the disease profile for hospitalization in the population, there's no match. So it all goes to bypass surgeries, coronary bypass, knee replacements, hysterectomies. In India, hysterectomies is a big issue. But over here, you have a whole number of other needs which are just, they are hospitalized, they go into it, fractures which doesn't get paid for. Administrative costs and inefficiencies, including corruption, take away a huge amount. There are multiple insurance companies that compete and there are co-payments that are involved. That means there are huge amounts, though it is cashless in name, nowhere is it even near cashless. And eventually, if you look at community-based sample surveys, a series of them have shown that financial protection is really not happening in any so the out of pocket expenditures and impoverishment due to healthcare costs happen in a vague way now though strictly speaking public providers are also eligible for being included in insurance schemes and m panel in in effect they get no advantage out of this whole issue the providers don't get any particular incentives and the systems work to actually bring in private not the public system and at some sense it doesn't really contribute. Other than the fact that on primary care, on outpatient care, on preventive care, insurance has just nothing to offer. So here publicly financed insurance as it was born and tried out in India has been largely and exclusively the purchasing has been for procedures of the hospital. So it's for a bypass surgery, it's not for management of coronary artery disease. And even there, there are almost no primary care. And in fact, they have not been able to construct one that is able to take care of primary care in an insurance purchasing route at all. The alternative that this leads to trying, which if it is not the insurance route, is the public-private partnership route, the PPP route. And adding another P really makes no difference to it. That's fashionable in times. In some sense, it's the private sector that dominates. The theory, theoretical understanding is that the owners of public services are not aligned, their incentives are not aligned, but a private owner, his profit motive makes him aligned to being handed over and therefore will be better. So there have been a lot of efforts to sign contracts with global budgets. And success is a matter of getting the contracts right and every wave of failures is met by declaiming itself and trying another wave of contracts. Now there have been a series. Over the last 15 years, a whole lot of areas where primary health centers have been uh, outsourced or sub-centers have been outsourced or district hospitals have outsourced. Almost always they go through a cycle. In the first one year when it is being deployed, there is a lot of enthusiasm. Everybody is asked to invite it. In two years, it goes into silence. In three years, it's a collapse. Usually, they are in the courts and it is completely dropped and quietly buried while the cycle starts off in other place. I can count at least offhand to 20 cycles of such public-private partnerships. Outsourcing ancillary services doesn't do badly. If you're outsourcing your laundry, if you're outsourcing your kitchen, if you're outsourcing your security services, if you're outsourcing even ambulance services, it does quite okay. But outsourcing the clinical provision of care has just not worked and it's difficult to understand. The only way to understanding it is that the limitation was not there in the issue of ownership. The limitations were in other parameters, in human resources, in logistics, in a whole lot of in the match between services offered and services needed. So you're fixing the wrong problem. And at some point, if you fix the wrong problem, you don't get anywhere with this. And at some point, as you strengthen the contracts, 
by repeated consultants. Today, the agencies are willing to take the government to court. And in Uttarakhand, in the latest version, the government can't open its uh, primary health center because the court has ordered a stay. They are not run, letting it run. And now you are also. So it's withdrawal of services by a company. So bizarre things happen within this. A new theme, therefore, is in town. And this we would call for the moment outsourcing geographies. It is a district as the contracting unit and payment by capitation fee. The key features of this new proposal is that the district would be a coordinating unit which would network all providers in the district. The network would be owned by an agency, government, quasi-government or private. If it is a private hospital, it would be similar to a health management organization. But even though many of them propose initially as government, what it does is it repackages it so that it becomes convenient for outsourcing to an agency tomorrow. So even today, it's, you're just reorganizing it so that it's good. This network would be paid by the National Health Insurance and the basis of payment would be a capitation fee, a per capita estimate of the cost of services to be provided in some mathematical probabilistic way and the package of services would be divided or decided by the National Health Insurance. Outside this package, the providers can charge fees. The narrower the package, the bigger the outside package and you start with a pilot in few districts. These are the features. Now, I was not describing South Africa. <laughs> I was describing the UHC expert committee report in India. And I have looked at the expert committee report in Philippines. And I have looked at the expert committee report now, after I came here, the green paper and white paper. And they say the same things. And this is a quotation from that. We recommend that government agencies be created with professional competencies the services should be integrated, substantially reform the manner so that they become effective purchasers of healthcare services, district specific needs, and this is the, the Indian report. And it says that right now district managers can't manage. However, over time it is possible to foresee a system where they would manage, consist experimenting with arrangements from an integrated network of combined providers. This is actually referring to the health management organization a la the US style. But these provider networks would be regulated by the government so that they meet the rules and requirements for delivering cost effective. And over here, uh, information technology is seen as the game changer in all these expert committees and would receive funds to achieve negotiated predetermined outcomes for the population would bear the financial risks and rewards and be required to deliver on health care. So if only 50% of the people, he spends only 50% of the money, if today your district officer spends 50% of the money, we'll tell him what a rascal he is, he ought to be changed. Tomorrow, if your district contracted network spends only 50% of the money, it say he's a high degree of efficiency and now can keep the remaining 50% as a reward. And some sense is really at some point the way in which you think about it that moves. Now, I was looking at the South African Green Paper and since then I looked at the White Paper. These are the paragraphs that say identical things. I don't think the worthy people copied from each other, but at some point it is curious that these exactly similar words are found in more than 10 to 15 papers across, as part of the health across nations. The district health provision will be established and the responsibility of contracting in the purchasing decision. So the district health authority will contract with the national health insurance and it will contract everybody else below them, will be the planned and adequate all the, initially, all districts may not be able to participate due to capacity constraint. Nonetheless, over a period of time, district managed. The same optimism was there in the Indian newspaper also. And the same realization that re today nobody can do it. And accredited providers will be contracted and reimbursed. Separation of functions of purchasing and provisioning. You see this particular architecture that is proposed on this. Now, What's interesting is across nations, expert groups are at work. And in contrast to your structural adjustment one, this one is really catalyzed by expert groups. And typically, all of them are proposed 
these proposed reforms are very silent on why they have come to such a pass. Typically, they do not analyze the past. They do not talk of selective care and what happened in 1993 to 2005. They take the existing dominance of private providers as a given and then proceed with this with the unhistorical understanding of this. And they call, and now this is, gets interesting. In contrast with your earlier neoliberal understanding that called for a retreat of the state, you are now talking of an overwhelming role of the state. A state that is everywhere, which is doing everything, which is regulating down the IT system in all these documents say they can actually record and see every single health encounter so that denial of care, which is an obvious follow out of this design can be prevented. So it's a really all powerful state. And finally, there is no market forces at work because your purchase is entirely contracted in and you have actually consumer choice is limited. Now, International expert groups also bemoan the fact that state institutional capacity to do these reforms is very limited, confuses state action to corporatize with public action. So somewhere the retreat of the state is replaced by a very active state and this is confused. But the most surprising thing is there is an irrational and very optimistic and touching faith in the ability of the government to purchase and regulate on such a scale when it has been so far unable to provide on a much smaller scale. So this sudden dichotomy that comes in this ability to purchase is something that is truly phenomenal in the way and in some sense it's so universal. Harvard, Hopkins, London School, every one of them is into this and it's interesting for us to really look at what happens. But there is another site that academia does not capture. This is a Pricewaterhouse uh, publication from the Health Research Institute 2011. It's a huge entry of private capital, venture capital. Venture capital demands a 35% return on investment. It exits at 5%, 10%. Only arms and drugs can actually operate on that scale of return on investment. <laughs> And it's venture capital, sometimes funded by IFC, the International Finance Corporation under the World Bank, which actually finances, at one another hand, a huge entry of foreign capital. And it also conveniently happens at a time when there is a recession, a global recession in the world. 2008, what is 2008 known for? Not for the launch of uh, high-level expert groups uh, recommending universal health coverage. They are known for the global recession. And this global recession, there was only one industry that did not go through the travails of industry, and that was the healthcare industry. Health remained evergreen, and there was a notion of how actually that needed to be expanded, and somewhere we need to actually start looking at some of these issues. And therefore, there are some open questions as to why not demand a national health services? Where did this logic, where did this flip happen? Why did we now start demanding, all of us included, start demanding a national health insurance? This is the same in India. I'm talking about India, believe me. South Africa is incidental. Is there any reason to believe that an NHI would be more? This is in the budget speech of our minister this year, that he's proposed a national health insurance, and now everybody is trying to work out what it means. Is there any reason to believe national health insurance would be more affordable than national health services? What ails the current public health services? If shift to purchasing will not solve these issues, what will? We need an alternative theoretical framework to address these issues and this is actually what I am coming to. I am really saying that at some point if you are where you are stopping is in this there is no other alternative dialogue. And the importance that academic communities need to take up, the challenge we need to take up is an alternative way of thinking about these problems so that we can actually do better and we can address and do create services that work and which are efficient. I'm One way of looking at it is to break up the problems as the problematics, the French word, which has a special meaning in sociology because it talks of a problem that admits of different solutions in different ideologies. It, the same problem at different times and in different contexts. A problem that will never go away but at some point will define the area. So if you look at how do you get doctors to rural areas, 
how you every country has that problem norway has it north of the arctic australia has it in its deserts brazil has it in its forests and each answers it differently and does so in a different time and does so and different answers on the different ideology so it's good to look at some of these key issues and see how we can answer them and at some point i have just looked at six or seven very selective care the fact that only public services cater to less than 15% of morbidities in in a country like india this is part of its draft national health policy statement it actually say 7 to 12% is what it covers getting the community as active participants not beneficiaries as responsible co-producers and not eager consumers the key issues of human resources quality of care health information everyone suffers with poor quality data and poor use of data access to medicines and technologies financing that meets just requir matches requirements and incentivize per performance and the problems of leadership and governance i just take a small sample of these and just quickly go through looking at an alternative approach and for the lack of a better word i call it a political economy approach though in some sense i find so many people make so many meanings of political economy approach that i just set down that in this approach value is not seen is uh, not seen as something defined by supply or demand which is the general equilibrium theory but it is defined by the terms of production the nature of productive forces and its relations of production Healthcare, in particular, requires trust, and trust requires that monetary and personal incentives are ring-fenced out of the provider-patient relationship. My major starting point on this is uh, the political economy of healthcare by Julian Tudor Hart. In some sense, I owe a lot which I take to this. And at some point, what you're saying is, whereas the purchaser-provider split is all about using. supply and demand as the logic here you are saying that at some point if you go to a doctor you should be sure that the only reason he has to put his pen to paper and prescribe for you has nothing to do with any incentive he gets and he has nothing but the complete you are able to post trust on him there is no question of choice in some sense uh this choice there is but in some sense one must understand it and the example that i give in some of this is a patient lying on the operation theater doctor comes surgeon comes to him stands over him with a knife and says tell me you have a choice should i make a vertical incision or a horizontal incision <laughs> patient is going to run out of the operation table <laughs> he hired the doctor to make that decision for him he gave the power of that attorney to the doctor to act on his behalf all he needs to be assured is that the doctor makes that decision only on his best interest and there is no way in which he will earn more or less because of what he did and what he did not do that's what i mean by saying ring fencing the ring fencing the actual point of contact from any monetary incentive is the condition around which trust really develops and this is a different way of thinking about it and individuals and communities are therefore not consumers of a commodity but co-producers of it where is health produced health is produced at the family at the level of the community and they are co-producers and their terms of engagement makes a difference prices matter as signals of institutions should be factored in but institutions are embodiments of power relationships and at some sense there is a historical path dependence that decides them so if we were to apply such a framework to look at these problems and try to come out with solutions you come out with different solutions so i do two things i really look at examples of what works which everybody agrees that what works and then reflect on what it means for my theory how it would fit into neoliberal understandings how it would fit into political economy understandings and i also see how reforms driven by theoretical approaches have actually played out on the ground and i do a lot of this on indian examples and with these eight areas that i have been looking at now for example more comprehensive packages of care work now i can't really find a example to scale in india but we have many small examples non governmental organizations this which show that actually they make a huge difference in terms of outcomes but on large outcomes you have the major example of brazil and thailand who are comprehensive to a fault 
so everybody kept asking them what do you mean comprehensive you can't provide everything for everybody can you provide organ transplants and that became their motto and they started they have the world's largest publicly financed organ transplant programs today and now recently they included sex change operations the only ones that are left out are cosmetic or surgeries which are purely proven to be cosmetic without medical value and at some point you have a huge thing the same thing with thailand is comprehensive there are lists of exclusion that are provided you will not do renal transplantation in an age above 75 where you are not expecting it you are not do these things within such a area but you are not actually got anything which is in the package is defined by its exclusions not by its inclusion and these are the most cost effective comprehensive programs in the world sri lanka also thailand does its comprehensive health care provision to all of its citizens at 4% of the gdp 3 per 3.3% of the gdp is its public health spend it's a very modest gdp i think it's less than south africa's and at some point it actually provides a much higher degree of comprehensive care than others and therefore we really need to look at this in a way and selective care has undermined the quality of perception so you go to a hospital you can't get uh, injection for diabetes you can't get an insulin injection you cannot get a fracture treated it's unlikely you will go there just for emergency obstetric care <laughs> and at some point at it the perception of poor quality for the poor person is not so much even by toilet cleanliness though it is important it is not it is if you go there and you are turned away saying that i can't get this service or can't get or you get inadequate care incomplete care that is really at some point the heart of it and more comprehensive packages require there is a public health perception requirement a rights based thing because you are denying care of many sorts to many people why should a 45 year man going to a primary health center not be able to get a spare spectacles that can take care of his press biopsy of his old age thing what is the great technology that prevents it why is it limited ophthalmic care means district hospital there are so many things that can be done over there a professional imperative how do you get a gynecologist into a place and then make them do in india we make them do only sterilization surgeries and some emergency c sections there's a whole range of professional satisfaction she gets by limiting her role in a particular way she has every motivation to run out of it and we bleed our specialists from the public health system there is financial efficiency issues and that and at some point selective care was driven by an ideology that it should be limited only to these areas which are externalities and market failures this is expressly stated in the 1993 world bank document world health report the rest would be taken care of by the market and we see that the net result of it is that even the priorities that you have mentioned are not being taken care of within such a framework the other thing we know that does work is community health workers community health workers work this is a program that works everywhere but it is not not got any position within the larger dialogue of the insurance based scheme and you don't really know how to cope with it there but it works best and we know this now from many examples and in the indian evaluations of the asha program the methanin program the comparisons between different states also brings this out where there is a combination of the role of facilitator to access government provided services local care provision that includes a certain degree of contact curative care which is required and an activist role where you are enforcing entitlements the old david werner argument of uh health workers as liberators not lackeys and there is a right mix of this not the prioritization of one over other so that's one thing that is a condition for success the other thing is that though government ownership is there it need cannot be run by the bureaucracy as such it requires special institutions and support structures and these support structures need to be friendly and these friend that therefore needs to require and reflect a high degree of community and civil society ownership so to some extent the mitanin program which actually just took up small scale very successful ngos at 30 village scale to a 30000 village scale whose success was critically dependent on building this new type of institution 
the State Health Resource Center that is led and participated in by civil society activists but funded by and owned by with government participation and guiding it. And this goes back and fits in within a political economy understanding where the nature of institutions, the terms at which you organize the processes, determine the value that it generates. It's not just a matter of how you pay for it or how you buy it. At some point, it is precisely the design of the institutions where the power relationship is embedded. The bureaucracy represents a post-colonial power relationship, which is good for control, which is good for law and order, but bad for service delivery, not anything to do with the notion of compassion. And if you are really going to work this in, you need to build an institutional design that can provide the space for this. And at some point, community health worker programs require these as conditionalities and fail in their absence. And this is something that we have emphasized in a big way on this. And we also emphasize that at some point, many times, even where the, the supportive structure is not there, it is the agency of the ASHA. It is the fact that the community health worker also has a mind of its own. At some points, the design was even... Many of them were designed to hard to become a, shall I say, a commission agent politely or impolitely a tout for the private sector. But at, it is the agency of the community health worker that has limited it to a less than 5% aberration. It is the fact that she makes choices and she advises people not to go there. They are cheating you. You go there because she comes from that community. Has to go back to that woman and can't be seen as having taken her to a place where she got fooled and cheated. And she would advise her because it is the village is part of a woman's extended family. And she's not going to cheat on that child over there. And she, therefore, to the dismay of the design, which at one point required them to be based on a commission, and whoever pays that commission, they would go for that. To their great dismay, the ASHA acted contrary to their expectation and became a part of public services rather than a part of the private care extension workers. At some point, this is something that has been studied and presented on over here. I'm not too sure about village and district health committees yet. But ideologically, in the understanding of political economy, that is the way to go. But what I am just using this to point out is just because at some point there are problems that you need to deal with here. And we have got patient welfare committees, hospital committees, facility committees that manage it. But there are problems in the way representatives are selected. There are problems in the direction of what they do and their capacity to do. And we have been very poor in handling them because their support structures come within the bureaucracy and we are not able to really manage this in the same degree. Civil society is not even quite willing to take on that responsibility. Participatory committees with modest budgets at village and this works. But the notion of planning village and assessing priorities doesn't work. What works is in reaching services to marginalized groups which are being left out in terms of outcomes, we found that actually this is, makes a fair degree of work on that. So there are things in it that works but not works. So district plans has been suboptimal. So I'm not saying we give up on this, but I'm saying that we have much more work to do. The point is that in the larger understanding of purchase and provider, this is really nowhere to go. In Human Resources for Health, let's put the issue of skills and numbers into one package of getting the right person to the right place with the right skills. If we look at it that way, what works and what doesn't work? Compulsion doesn't work. They've even tried uh, military recruitment in places and it doesn't work. China, for example, it can compel its mothers to deliver at the institution but cannot compel its doctors to go there. If China fails on compulsion, there is not much chance that India can. Okay, and India has been terrible on compulsion even by raising the rates of uh, penalty and forfeit. It doesn't really work. And you can take a horse to the water or a doctor to the clinic but you can't make him treat. Monetary incentives work in part but if they are high enough. So in, uh, and that really becomes a difficult. Thailand, a person going to a village will get 30,000, 50,000 baht as compared to 20,000 is the thing, two to three times higher. 
but that most people find difficult. Educational approaches work best and what do we mean by them? Locality based selection, training, deployment of trainees works best. What are we saying? We are saying that what do you mean nobody wants to go there? There are people there. That's why you want to go there in the first place. If the people who are living there can be empowered to provide care, you have your best chance of providing care over there. And though there are problems with higher level skills, which even have been managed in certain areas in Philippines and Nepal, but for most skills, short of the medical and specialist skills, you can actually manage the workforce problems with that. But it needs also an appropriate curriculum and it goes along with developing new professional boundaries. So in some sense you have, if you take mid-care providers in Chhattisgarh we have the rural medical assistant and in uh, Assam we have a community health practitioner is very much like your physical uh, three-year assistance here works very well. Community health workers are a new definition. Nurse practitioners are a new definition. We don't like to use the task shifting as something like a default value. You shifted, they had one task, you should. People are, any person can do the job that he is trained and defined as doing. So if a nurse is trained to provide clinical care, then she can provide clinical care and support it to provide it. So nurse practitioner, family medicine specialist, for example, Nepal has been able to manage its lack of specialists by being able to take medical officers and give them a training where they are a basic specialist who can do a range of services. So we have enough evidences of actually that this works relatively better compared to all other issues and positive work environment and peer support. Yet so often governments remain obsessed with the notion of compulsion and very often unfortunately civil society would also be quoting compulsion as the main working feature. What does not work in human resources forever other than compulsion? Performance based payments, the jury is really out, I mean in India I think it should be closed there, there is really nothing that has worked, we've tried it in different forms and sometimes you have very perverse incentives, but in Asha for example, you would, if you pay her for per person she takes to the clinic for a delivery, and soon she recognizes that she need not waste her time on the most marginalized because they are unlikely to convert to an earning opportunity. She'd rather find her, spend her time on those who are sure to go. Which makes the whole meaning of the program absurd. So at some point your ability to game the system in performance based payments is so immense that there is a way if you can go on changing the rules, perhaps it will work. But I, I don't know whether those things work, but in practice they have not worked. Contractual terms of employment, daily wage things don't work. Heightened monitoring based on IT systems, oh how we believe in it. We actually try to staple down, we have installed video cameras within, we have put mobile phones on GPS and tracked them. We've done every single possible way of monitoring. Because you are convinced that they are a workforce which is all intent on running away and not working and defaulting. But most of the time they are providing care and coping with a completely insensitive administration. And if, if it actually works as a two-way communication, they will be ringing up saying our drugs are not here, or this are not here, or that is, there were a hundred different issues to complain about. So in some sense, all these heightened monitoring IT systems just don't work. Outsourcing employment to HR agencies, this is the new fashion in town. Get an HR agency that will buy, hire nurses from somewhere, and you pay the HR agency and you don't pay nurses. Doesn't help. People keep... It's in a consumer movement, people will move for the very next faculty. You do need to build a patient-doctor relationship, you do need to build affection, you do need to build trust. And if you don't have that, how will your service work? If every day you go there, some other nurse is sitting there and she has no loyalty to the particular place or the service, it does not work, it's been tried again and again. Unfortunately, it's not interesting for anybody to document failures. And we have lots of quietly buried uh, such neoliberal initiatives, quietly buried when they are opened up again at the level of theory. And public-private partnerships as a means of HR doesn't work at all. Quality of care. 
what does not work competition and choice does not work i pay well to my doctors you many of you know how many times can you actually tell a doctor or he'll tell you quietly i am neither doctor or you the doctor you don't really establish uh, by paying the money anything well it just an uh, effectiveness on efficiency disciplinary approaches have very low result to some degree if you have a 5% 10% discordant indisciplined person disciplinary approach is useful but if there is something happening on a 50% 70% scale you have to look at systemic issues discipline is not going to be the issue and private led quality standards and their implication do not apply now what works because this is interesting we and my group in national health systems resource center i'm proud to say actually work with public health facilities using a modified total quality management approach and over 400 500 facilities we were able to show measurable and sustained improvements and it was really a simple thing of um, mapping the processes re-engineering the processes training people sensitizing people hand holding them it requires an investment but it makes a difference and there is both quality on clinical effectiveness of care because you can shift mothers to the institutions but then you shift maternal mortality to the institutions you don't make it safer unless you have done infection control unless you have done uh, emergency time unless you so you have this whole clinical effectiveness and you have dignity patient care comfort of care but these can be handled they are managed by institutions and processes that are studied and and what's the big news the big news is you go to the largest corporate hospitals and how do they impose quality by the same standard processes you are talking of jci you are talking of other quality standards so the large corporate hospitals also need this for corporate quality except that in india the quality council of india's first job was to set quality standards to favor medical tourism so when people in the uk wanted to get treated at much cheaper rates or the insurance company wanted to send them at treatment rates they had to be assured that india is not poor quality it's good quality so it's jci standards and the entire bunch of standards that were written by quality of council of india was written on the terms of a reference that had prioritized medical tourism they were really not written about making available affordable care in areas and it took a long time for us to come out we just come out last year with a set of standards that is really applicable that does not talk of air conditioning corridors and uh, i think which actually has no relevance to uh, people are very uncomfortable in air conditioned rooms they can be extremely chilly to people who work in india's hot uh, thermometer imagine you have to be uh, without your clothes i am told by german uh, quality uh, experts that it was the air conditioning in many of these situations was introduced largely to make the doctors feel more comfortable which i think is important but i don't think needs to become a mandatory quality standard because it's really got nothing to do the cost of electricity for a hospital of that sort would be more than their current expenditure if you centrally air condition a nursing home like that and you can keep it cool through other means so this is the whole issues of standards and the politics of standards that we have actually seen on this on health information systems i'll just give you one example because we must feel somewhat better in the third world after hearing this example is uk the united kingdom spent on health management information systems they made a grand plan with which they put a budget of 11.4 billion dollars pounds 11.4 billion pounds and that time the pound was really high that was <laughs> much before brexit so you had actually a very good uh, thing 11.4 billion pounds and this was because of they were going into this contracting mode and they wanted to measure and capture every health encounter they spent close to 6.4 billion pounds it's much more than our health budget on healthcare it before the central auditor general reviewed it and shut it down as a total waste of money leading nowhere a complete useless thing and it was shut down and some people say there was spin off benefits etc but nobody seen them and at some point it's interesting to know that 
so much IT investment has gone in into improving this. It's, look at the banking system or a transport system. IT has transformed it. In the health system, it's lived far below its expectations. And part of the reason is that IT systems meant to empower centralized monitoring fail. But those that enable the provider-patient interface actually enable providers which are primarily meant for their use and as collateral information for monitoring flows tend to do much better. Insurance-based architecture which are developed from insurance companies needs make the patient transparent to the company. Do not make the company transparent to the patient. So these are all one-way transparencies. So in some sense you really have a problem on the fact that you cannot actually know on what basis your claims was rejected, what was the processing, what was the loop and at some point they are meant to do that. And IT systems meant to standardize care where every are actually things that they really don't do because there is so many difficulties. But systems that trust and enable provider to provide care work. Interestingly, the DHS, the District Health Information System of South Africa is one positive example that I study in this area. It was part of the uh, 1994 liberation movement and set up in those terms as part of a system that can actually support decentralized planning and patient popular control over the day. So in some sense, UWC is one of the few places which actually practices and teaches DHIS2 among all schools of public health I know and I'm a great uh, fan of that. I, there is however a caution that at some point uh, it's not necessarily renewed itself into the newer challenges that are there. And I have heard critiques that it has ceased to be either district or information systems on that at a district level and it has become. And of course PEPFAR funding has now entered a major way at Oslo but that's maybe by the way. But I think you have a serious issue but there has been a strength and in fact this is one of the models that I really present of what was a positive example that we can learn from is the district. South Africa's architecture is relatively much better than that but you may lose it because if you see the white paper, what it obliquely refers to is the UK architecture. And at some point you have something that to build on and you may lose it for something which is far below that performance. Now in access to essential medicines, I would not have spent time on a detail. But I do this because I heard in the assembly so much discussion on stockouts. You have even an organization on stockouts, try to understand and I understand why your priorities have developed on that. In India, we have a model that works phenomenally well. It was created in 1993. Up to date, it performs performs in every single way. And it eliminates stockouts, assures high quality of drugs, assures even a preference for local providers, despite all the WTO, etc., so that it stimulates and uh, supports local industry without compromising on quality and it supply responsive to consumption rates. IT has been applied on it now, but it's much later. The system does not depend critically on IT, though IT is good and it enables it. And it uses a symbol of passbooks where the monetary value of drugs given at each CHC primary health center is noted. It aggregates at the district and a rate contract enables to be supplied. I can't go into the details now but simply put it works and it depends upon institutional design that makes it work. It's in some sense the way the framework and it has what has not worked we have outsourced to somebody called crown agencies which are the world's best providers in procurement agency didn't work. We outsourced to UNOPS, which is an agency that undertakes procurement of uh, value. Doesn't work. Never managed to procure even iron and folic acid in a tablet in time. Okay, for our... Uh, in India, it's, the quantities are huge, so you can perhaps excuse them. But at some point, the TNMSC gets it right, and it's a local innovation that has done well. And IT-based initiatives, where is IT-led does not. I'll skip this. I just want to take some time on financing, just two minutes before I close on this. Now, in financing, India doesn't do particularly well, there's no particular model, but one which I would think merits a bit of discussion is the Thai model. 
Thailand has a government agency called the NSSO, which is dedicated to financing. But important to note that it is also under the Ministry of the Health. It has two different directors. So it's one division over here, one directorate over here. Over 95% of the funds flow to public sector facilities. Only in Bangkok is private participation about 50%. Fund flow to districts where from there to rural hospitals and primary health centers and the planning for use of funds is done by the district and provincial office. And it justifies budget request on one basis, that is the NSSO justifies the budget request to the finance ministry on one basis, total number of patients handled, total population, total number of diseases it covers and for if uh, you bring in HIV, ARV is brought in then immediately there is a markup to the figures that they present on one basis and it is another basis on which they allocate to the facilities. The facilities receive it on one basis so it acts like a formula, a norm for budget allocation and then it uses another norm to spend it. That's important and I've actually done some work on this and traced this. So it's a global budget based on size of population served and registered, integration peripherally with other insurance schemes. So the you've not got a single payer at the top. What you've got is if you are under a central government insurance scheme, then your card is registered there and whatever primary care you're there is booked to that scheme. And in the population which is covered, that many patients who are on other schemes are subtracted out of it. So that organization is done at the primary health center and this global budget is kept. Salaries are fixed and flow separately. So the salaries don't go through this. The salaries flow through the usual department treasury route and supplies are booked and bought from public pharmacy chain and quality of care group incentives are there for team incentives. No individual pay pay payments are there. Now, it's somewhat important to discuss this because Thailand in international literature is uh, often projected as the ideal of provider payer split. And why I would present it rather as a flexible form of budgetary allocation to public services as an institutional arrangement that is much more responsive rather than this is for some of these features. First, there is no competition and choice in the selection of a provider. There is none. The district hospitals and the facilities are the providers that contract it. It is always the public agency except where there are gaps and some supplementation is required. So in all of uh, by, uh, Thailand, there is one uh, agency which is not public. There is no competition and choice in selection of provider by the service user. So it's not as if the service user has any number of facilities that he can choose with. His primary care entitlement is with one facility. Strictly speaking, it is with four. But this four is meant to be a maximum in case he is seasonally migrating on work. So when he migrates to another place, he can register there. It does not, should not be interpreted to mean he can choose any one of the four. It's something like the neighborhood schools, you have the neighborhood clinic and it provides you an entitlement. There is no package of services. There is no boundary on how much you consume. There is no saying in a typical package, a diabetic can have five outpatient visits, one inpatient visit. It's not like that. A diabetic can go any number of time he needs to go. But there are certain uh, things that will not, services which are excluded and that is available on the exclusion list. So it's the notion of assured services, not the notion of package of services. Though the Thais being Thais, they will present it in whichever language makes you happy. So if you, and then they will continue to work in Thai and you don't, and, and providers get paid the same. The community health workers, they have 1.4 million community health workers for a population of, uh, uh, how much is it? Uh, 8 crores, so 80 million. 80 million population, there are 1.4 million and one health worker for 17 households. And they say, you know, we are not able to meet our target of 1 for 15. And they are paid 600 baht per month, which is about 1,200 rupees, which would mean about 100 uh, rands or whatever it is. So in some sense, you have actually got a workforce that has a youth. And the flow for this is separate. It's a separate channel that goes from the Ministry of Local Governments to the local government and it's paid out of there. So in some sense, you are not using financing as any tool of either defining quality of care, but you are made financing 
much more responsive. So you see last year how many patients you treated, inpatients you treated and based on that you give that. Now it seems simple but in India it's remarkable. So we have two sub-centers, one caters to 5000 population, another to 10,000 population. One has got 100 deliveries happening per month, another has got zero and yet both would get the same amount of funds and sometimes even the same amount of drugs. Obvious absurdity in public systems management and allocation of funds. Those are the things that they put to right in a much more responsive financing. But because they do that to actually look at it, so in some sense responsive financing which meets requirements calculated in a much more dynamic way makes the huge difference and it is not really issues on that. I'll skip this issue on leadership and governance, but perhaps you can just take in what is written on the slide. It's not about the charismatic leader. It is, uh, in fact, you need charismatic leaders if you have very poor designs, except for the initial one who sets the rules. The, the usual issue is at some point you have to define its legal and constitutional space, define its governance mechanism and then you have to set in a norm of work and culture and you can learn within your own country, you can see certain institutions which are public but do very well and many which are public but do very poorly. If you can actually learn from it and build on it, there is lots of things that one can actually do on. Because many institutions have developed under colonial administrations and they are unsuited for service delivery and participation. There are two relationships of power that get carried in. One is the colonial one, which is the administrative one. But there is also professional power. And that to unpack that is an entirely different issue. And the National Health Mission, a whole range of new institutions had to be created. The mission steering group, for example, is the APEC institution. It has the powers of the cabinet. A uh, section of cabinet members are there. But there are also members from civil society, including from the people's health movement. The, our global uh, representative now, Sarojini, is a member. One person with an ethics background and one with a field background is a member. It's a member and you have civil society representatives. And yet, actually, its allocations have the same powers of the cabinet. There are limitations with that, but they have great strengths. National and State Health Systems Resource Center, for instead of depending upon development partners for technical assistance, you actually created national institutions which had the flexibility that development partners had, which could pay comparable salaries to what they could pay, which is an important criteria if you're going to have high talent within that area, and could provide the same degree of support. And it was important, even the Medanin program would not have happened without the State Health Resource Center, and one had to redesign these institutions. ASHA mentoring groups for community health workers, all the leading NGOs involved in community health work form an advisory council that feeds in through the State Health, on which all programs and policy changes have to be checked out with them before they become policy on that. This advisory it cannot make the law, but it certainly to be heard is itself very powerful in these areas. Now, we, therefore, there is a lot of earnings, but it fits within a different framework which we can understand. Now, how can people's health movement and progressive academia contribute to this change for strengthening public health systems? Broadly, for people's health movement, it's by providing voice, by proposing alternatives, and by shaping implementation. And, the th and very often, we emphasize one or two out of the three, but seldom all three, but the needs of coordination require when some windows of opportunity open up all three. One has to be cautious about this voice. We recently had a Human Rights Commission hearing, which we had earlier also, which was very successful. This time we had a hearing, but because there was a much greater private participation, we said we want to bring in denial of right to health care, not only what happens in the public health facilities, but also at private health facilities, which they said, no, the government can't intervene in private. But he said, you're paying them. They are under a partnership. They are under an MOU. They are a panel with a hospital. So you have a particular role. So let's him. They, till the end, did not uh, allow you. So if you have got complaints against the public system, you are most welcome. 
theories of voice work. But if you have complaints against private system, even if they are empaneled, then you cannot complain. In official court uh, authorities r r refuse you the role to actually make a complaint. And denial happens all the time. You have an insurance premium and the provider does cherry picking. He will turn you out if the particular thing does not have a high margin of profit for him. But he will provide that care if it has a high margin. And at some point you cannot use your insurance card as an entitlement in the private sector, which you can in a public sector. You can't say, look, I've got an insurance card, you've got to admit me. It doesn't work. You can say that in a public facility it works. And this huge difference is there. So voice has its own constraints in these times and proposing alternatives and by shaping implementation on this. So in some sense, these things are built into these systems. And PHM as voice, People's Health Movement as voice, we've had fa facility functioning surveys, People's Health Watch, repeated waves of it which come up with report, denial of right to healthcare hearings, protest marches on local health and issues, which we have been able to leverage very much for being able to intervene in public health systems on that. We have PHM as alternative policies also. In fact, this slogan is very Nishulk Dava Yojana Me APL BPL Karna Band Karo. APL is above poverty line, BPL is below poverty line. So, on free drug scheme, stop making a difference between uh, APL and BPL is the demand. And that is Narendra Gupta leading this protest march in Rajasthan. And Rajasthan has introduced free drugs in public hospitals, which was one of the initiatives that has happened. But they have limited it to below poverty line. And when people come to take care, they hardly bring their poverty line card with them. And anyway, the means testing is extremely weak. And who comes and stays all day in front of a public hospital in a district hospital except the poorest? And at some point, there is no need. It's a self-selection issue. And this, therefore, is a policy demand. So in some sense, you are not demanding voice in a very abstract sense. You are really demanding alternative policies and the framing of alternate policies that you work for and being able to combine it with local issues and make demands has been one of the areas that we have worked at. And there has been also a PHM role in implementation strategy. You see this national summit, this was in Srinagar. After that, there has been in Shimla, and in a few days from now, they are going to, every two years, three years, they hold, a, the government holds a seminar, which we set up as NHSRC long back, but we have, this is the seventh or eighth, which really looks at examples from within public systems of what works, and presents it and shares it among all the state leaders, so that they can learn from each other, and they can work on in public health care system. So look at it in an alternative way in which we can actually project these measures. Of course, there's a whole uh, uh, games that go on to find your uh, impact innovation on the table. It's not easy to get your space there. But then we allow posters. So it does allow a space. It does allow thinking on it. So in some sense, opening up this space for actually participating in intervention is required. We, the People's Health, the National Assembly put the demand for a community health worker in every village in 2000 when community health workers were limited to not more than a few thousand villages. Now it is there everywhere. But when the government says it will implement, if actually people who have thought about it, worked on it, studied it, are not available not only for drafting it, but actually on a day-to-day garnering it, many of these ideas will go waste. And at some point, how do we coordinate those who work within? How do we build the capacity of these members? How do we, are challenges that are, we are facing? So we find uh, these are, uh, thing. and one of the things that really impedes us is the whole of thinking about alternatives is so garnered to a market-based, financing-based thinking that there is a need to actually think in ways in which reimagine and represent a thing where it is the organization of service delivery which is the fundamental part. Financing is the key, as are other issues. 
but at some point it is really about how service delivery at what terms they are delivered what are the sort of relationships between people in this purchase do they face each, each other as consumers and uh, sellers or do they face themselves as partners and co-consumers these are the things that need to be done if we are really going to do so there are many detailed steps but eventually there is also a theoretical framework that we need to advance on this thank you thank you Sinda. a tour de force on the problematics Thank you very much. Um, and one picture in all of those slides uh, that you held our attention. Very well. Thank you. I'm going to hand over now to David, who's going to do the formal vote of thanks before we go out for refreshments. Uh, thank you very much, Helen, and also for your kind words and yours too, DBC. So, um, Helen took my words. I was going to say it's a tour de force. I will say it was a tour de force. So, thank you very much, Sunda. It was, was wonderful. And I want to assure the audience that I did not tell him to look at our NHI. <laughs> but he said what I've been thinking for some time. And uh, I showed him the People's Health Movement response to the white paper, which we thought was quite radical. He said, doesn't go far enough. And he showed us tonight. I also didn't tell him about more community health workers who should be able to do more. Luckily, he said it. When I say it, no one listens, but he's got all of you to listen tonight. And... Um, I think he's really highlighted a whole number of issues which we really do need to attend to. I think we need to be a lot more radical in what we say about our health policies and um, we need to challenge some of the shibboleths. So, Sunda, I, you say you remember meeting me before 2004. I, I remember meeting you in 2004 in Pune at uh, what I think may have been a landmark meeting where community health workers were being talked about, but this was actually a prelude to the development of, very soon after, the National Rural Health Mission. Now, I'm surprised I can't remember meeting you earlier because my memory for long ago is excellent. So, uh, so that meeting was terribly interesting for me because, amongst others, Sunda and his colleagues spoke about two new provinces, Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, and about some of the experiments that were being done there with community health workers. And... Some of the evidence was presented. In fact, I think some of the evidence was presented by Raman. And Raman became a master student of ours. He nearly stayed one forever, but eventually he did pass. <laughs> um, but he, uh, Sulakshna, uh, and others who worked with you, Bandana, all became our master's student, and they all shone in different ways. When I went back to India a few years later, I think it was 2007, Raman took me to Chhattisgarh, and he said we had to travel by train. I really looked forward to this journey. But it was one of the most uncomfortable of my life, I can't remember who I shared a bunk with. I'm sure I shared with someone. And I arrived in Chhattisgarh. It was very hot. And we went out to the district to meet with the Mitani. And although I was exhausted, I was really woken up by these ladies. So these ladies were very militant. They um, described to us some of the, what we call health promotion they did 
which included, and I'm sure you've heard the story, about stopping a logging project by actually snatching the axes and saws of those who were deforesting their land. They chased out the contractors. They then told me that they used to have a problem with men abusing their women. And this was because the men got drunk. So what did they do? They went around and just broke all the liquor stills in the villages. So maybe we should, you know, maybe we should teach some real health promotion. So it's been wonderful to have Sunda here. We've worked together, um, People's Health Movement. We've met each other over the years, on and off. Um, I've sympathized with him when some of the people in the People's Health Movement were critical because he entered public service and changed it from the inside. Wonderful. Uh, and he did a wonderful job. And now, of course, he's in academia, but not real academia, but like us, you know, sort of engaged at the interface of research and service delivery. And it's been great having him staying at my house, even though we've been arguing all the time about <laughs> politics. And I'm afraid some who we went to dinner with last night were subjected to this, and they've been receiving emails all day as our dialogue continues. So Sunda, thank you very much for having come. You honored us by your presence. And I'm sure everyone here was woken up by some of the framework that he presented to us, and I hope that it's got us all thinking. Thank you. So I have uh, presentations to give to you. But we must take a photo. This. <laughs> yes. We, we will have a photograph. <laughs> so th this is to keep you dry in the monsoons and these are for you to bring to my house because I need flowers in my house. 